Hi, before we get started today, I got two things I wanted to mention. One, the music that you hear in the background is by my band, Lorenzo's Music, or at least the music in the background of the show. There's nothing going on right now. But anyway, it's by my band, Lorenzo's Music, and we just released a new mixtape called Romcom Mixtape, and some of the songs that you hear on this show are on that mixtape. So if you want to check it out, you can go to the American Bandito website and just visit the music section and the entire playlist is there to uh, stream from YouTube or you could check it out with uh, their Spotify links, all that kind of good stuff there for you to check it out. So go to the AmericanBandito.com website and go to the music section and check out my band Lorenzo's Music, new rom-com mixtape. Now, the second thing is I did another pop-up event this past week And I have a few items that are left over, and I wanted to just say you could come get what I have left. So I have uh, a couple of my mini comics. So I have a collection of handmade mini comics, bundles of the first three months and the second three months of my comic blog. What else do I got? Ooh, I have some blank notebooks. Some of them are lined and some of them are blank sketchbooks, and they have the American Bandito logo on them. So you could get those as well. And I also have a bunch of stickers. If you want some American Bandito stickers, you can go to the site and get them. Just visit the American Bandito website and go to the store section, and you can find all the stuff that I have left over. So I've got like five notebooks and maybe a couple of bundles left. So head over to the AmericanBandito.com website, Visit the store section and check out all the handmade goods that I have left over. You know, support, gotta support the show. Seinfeld reference, I think. Anyway, here's the show. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. The person that I meet today, I learned about from Chris Lay, who had written an article about this show for the Isthmus. I started following her on Instagram, and I love the raw style and humor of her illustrations. I think the best explanation for what she does is this illustration she made for what an older woman said to her when she approached her booth at an event. She said, you look innocent, but you are quite raunchy. Rachel Dugan, and I am an illustrator. Rachel was doing butt portraits at the Tone Madison anniversary party, and my wife and I got one. And so settle down, it's just you turn around and she draws a picture of your backside. I contacted her after that event about being on the show, and the place that she chose for us to meet in her neighborhood was the Madison Sourdough Bakery, which I hate to admit it, but I had never actually been there. And while we were there, we saw Haley from the earlier episode who does the booty prints, and I was talking to the woman that did butt portraits. Some yeah. other people have mentioned you to her. Yeah, really. I, I met somebody at the library, and they were like, "Oh my god, you have to see her work." And really? She was like, "She does embroidered butts," and I was like, "That's so cool." I was like, "That's so funny." It's just another person who right? really well, loves. Well, yeah, butts. I'm not the only one. I thought. Yeah. But I'm so glad. It's yeah. Branching out, you know. I am from Northern Illinois. I'm from a burb of Chicago, okay. and I moved here about a year ago from Chicago, where I'd been living for like the last 11 years. Why did you move here? I said that like, it's like, why, why the hell would you come here? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's funny because at the time, it just seemed like everything kind of like stacked up, kind of feeling like time to move, time for a change. Me and my partner were like, where should we go? We want to be close to family. We're both from like Chicagoland area. And we came to Madison on a weekend trip, just on a whim. Okay. And then we said, could we live here? We both said yes. And then two months later, we moved. What was the weekend trip? Like, why would you even come here to begin with? <laughs> well, we had we have a friend who lives here, and she was like, come stay with me and check, check it out, you know? And um, we, I don't know, we were looking for nature, more nature and maybe more calm in our lives. So we just came up here in September, and it was like 70 degrees, like beautiful, perfect weather, and we both were like, I think this is what we want. And so, yeah, we just went for it. The Tony Madison anniversary party, you were there doing butt portraits. So how is that your main uh, line of work, butt portraits? Um, (laughs) I think when I do live drawing and I just set up a table and draw things, 
butts are the most popular item. Um, I've tried to do other things like paranormal portraits. I've done spirit animal portraits and yeah, it always kind of comes back to butts. Like people just, and it's actually the easiest kind of most fun thing to draw on the right. spot. So yeah, I, I would say if I'm going to do live drawing, I, I'm all about butts. So I, that's my preference. That's- is there a movement I'm not aware of? I think so, yes, yeah. And, and recently I've had almost kind of like a, an internal dialogue of like, should I stop? Should, have I like maxed out on, on butts? Like, <laughs> because even a while ago, somebody sent me a picture from like West Elm or like CB2 of like this butt montage that was like two hundred dollars. No. Yes, and I and they were like, "Is this so you?" You're and, for you, like, <laughs> and I was like, two, "Who would pay two hundred dollars for that?" Number one, I'm just kind of like, it's a print at CB2 or something, you know. Yeah. Anyways, but I was like, "Whoa!" And then I thought, "Wow," I'm like, "This is this is such a thing," and you know, obviously, I wouldn't claim to be like the first person to draw a butt because I'm not. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would say yeah, the frequency that I see, but themed things has grown but I also see like boob art like there's a lot of like and I haven't really dabbled in that I feel like butts like it fits my toilet humor I guess so I think I mostly I I mean it is offensive but it's like well it's supposed to be and yours is just like oh that's funny I really do appreciate some cartoonists or because you fear like what people will say to you or think of you or like if you really like almost get too like violent aggressive or disturbing and so yeah I feel like with my work I do try to kind of balance it with humor and in fun to where it's not just like like vile sometimes it's just celebrating the what's what's the way of putting it like the normal person human yeah like the like the milk rainbow that to me is actually very I don't even know I didn't even know what you're talking about so funny your own artwork (laughs) yes like that one is it's it's funny but at the same time too it's just celebrating like whoop de doo look at what I can do breast milk yeah yeah <laughs> totally yeah and and sometimes I wonder like because I definitely feel like sometimes people like your work and other times people don't and so not all the feedback that I get is good but j- I would say the majority is positive which I think helps because I think if I was putting things out there and people were really like disturbed by it it would probably get to me because I I like to be non-offensive I guess like careful with with what I do so I'd say it's one after the other going through your artwork there's the uh oh that's pretty funny and slightly offensive which I find that amazing (laughs) and then there's oh that's the picture that she has in the window at the library (laughs) yeah yeah I I feel like I kind of have like a back and forth thing going where it's like I kind of want to get away with things a little bit and yeah. push push it a little bit but also I do want to be like a children's book illustrator so there and you know when you do look at famous children's book illustrators a lot of them have books of nudes or kind of weird bizarro creepy drawings that they Show also did yeah like <laughs> there are things like like Dr. Seuss like there are all these like people who you know nobody's one-sided you do have all these other sides it's just trying to balance it out and yeah not offend a connection or a client that you have that you want to keep this is kind of in connection with a person that i talked to yesterday i met him he does a thing called american trash that's his instagram account so and his stuff is cool and he does like some stuff that's a little bit raw and some of it's kind of out there but he doesn't post about himself online and that's because he separates it from his graphic art account You don't do that. So what made you decide to go like, no, this is me. This is what I do. I don't know. I think, I think it would be too hard for me to, to separate it. But I guess maybe when I started out posting on Instagram, I, I, I mixed in more photos of like what I was up to or maybe like non illustration things. And then once I noticed that people were more interested in my illustrations, I kind of just shifted towards that. And then it became more of my identity as I went along because And I was like, well, I'm going to post every single day. I'm going to make sure I'm drawing every day. I'm posting projects and things. And so sometimes, like, if I go on vacation or something, I'll, like, do my stories of, like, what I'm up to. Or, like, now there's, like, all these other layers of things that you can still incorporate yourself. But generally, when I, yeah, I guess when I think of, like, my public persona, air quotes, whatever that is, that I just 
I'm like, I'm an illustrator and that's it. You're not uh, apologizing for what you do. I guess that's what I was kind of leading up to. I love the fact that one right after the other, you're like, here's the stuff I did when I was teaching kids at the library. And then here's the stuff that makes me laugh or, you know, uh, stuff that's important to you. Like you just recently did the portraits of women. Tell me about that. Like, did you do that once a day or did, how did you do those drawings? That was my second year doing that. I started it last year and for that month, I just, one day I had an idea and I was like, I should draw portraits of women because I often do portraits of like political figures or things like current events. And then I was like, I should draw women. And then I sat down to do it and I couldn't think of women to draw. It, it was very sad. I like cried and like sat there and I was like, I'm full of shit. I, I need to like work on this. Like here I am, oh, I'm feminist. I care about women's issues and rights and equality and, and politics and social things. And then, you know, when you sit down, you're like, oh, who are the five women I can name on, you know? And then when you go beyond that, you're like, no, I need to like think of 30 women, which still is not a, a huge number, but, right. and, and so then I was like, I should try harder. I should do research. I should look up women. I should look up not just white women and not just, you know, just kind of pushing myself out of like what I knew or what I know and hopefully sharing stories, even if it's just like a little quick little thing just from basic research online to identify people who've done important things or who are doing important things. And so this is my second year I did it for March and I usually do them ahead of time because it's really hard to spontaneously do like portraits and get their bio written and everything mm -hmm. so I, I do it in advance and if anybody if anything pops up like pop culturally or something happens maybe I'll do a quick portrait like the night before like I don't know to, to mix in some fresher stuff but my sister-in-law is a screen printer and so she prints I do like a montage poster of it each year after I post after I post all of them so that way you can kind of see everything together yeah it's really just an exercise to try harder and do more and even as a female artist you also point out that your stuff is all like one-offs hand-drawn I really don't have a lot of things that are printed multiple duplicates of things very few things like the poster yes because that would be crazy for me to light box like an 18 by 24 <laughs> thing and make whatever but I typically do drawings every day and I do them on uh, like printer paper like crappy 8 by 10 paper if it's popular I put it on my store and then I will make duplicates when they sell so Basically, I have a light box, and if I sell something and I sell them for $20, unless it's like a really intense drawing that takes more time, then I'll upcharge it. But I, I like that they're handmade and that they're an actual original drawing and there's something accessible about that. And often when I do sell at markets and I have all these like duplicates made, people, oh, do you have a print of this? Do you have a print of this? Or I like this print, and I always have to be like, it's actually hand drawn, you know, like these are all hand drawn. And for me, I really like doing it by hand. And I like that my work is so conducive to doing it by hand. It's not like I'm creating these super, you know, intense line drawings that are like taking me hours. No, I can do it very quickly. And it, it makes more sense for me to do that than to pay a printer to print stuff for me. And so how did you get started even getting into art and illustration at all? I grew up just always drawing. That was kind of my thing. My my dad and my brother, my dad really like encouraged us to draw and I really liked holidays. When it was like time for Halloween, I would hand draw like all the decorations and like put them all over the windows or like I just like want to like capture the season or the moment and it often looked so bad. Like it just be like our windows covered in like these shitty drawings all over. I like trying to like set the vibe. I like, and I love animals. So like we, we'd make all sorts of drawings of dogs and drawings of our family, like drawings of the yard. And my dad would sometimes just ask weird questions. Like he'd be like, if you had a spaceship, what would your spaceship look like? And so then we'd draw it and come up with stuff and just, just using our imaginations and having the like 
I don't know, the comfort of going there all the time. It wasn't ever like, oh, you have to color in the lines. It's just like, do whatever you want, and it's cool. So I went to Columbia in Chicago, and I studied art history first because I liked history so much. And then I was really into like architecture and learning about like different eras and time and just like the history of art. At the end of my career in college, I felt like I wasn't making anything, and I wanted to make things. So then I convinced um, my an illustration professor, Ivan Brunetti, who's a crazy cartoonist, someone who goes to dark places. And um, can I just interject here? <laughs> okay, let me really interject here. The reason I decided to do this podcast spawned from one of Ivan Brunetti's books that I was reading. When she said he was her teacher, I know I must have just got like a look of total amazement on my face. And if you listen again, to the part before I spoke, you can kind of tell Rachel's looking at me like, why is he looking at me like that? Then I convinced um, my an illustration professor, Ivan Brunetti, who's a crazy cartoonist, someone who goes to dark places. Um, and can I just interject here? <laughs> yeah. The entire reason I'm doing this is because of him. So a few years back, I went to Texas. This is going to this, this is going to lead somewhere, I promise you. I went to Texas. My wife was opening one. She had just started working for Sundance Cinemas. They were opening theaters and all, all over the place. I wanted to go to an indie bookstore. I wanted to go to like some neighborhood that wasn't like in the middle of Houston. That's where we were in Houston. The guy that was opening there is like, oh, you got to go to this place. And it was an independent bookstore, a bunch of random like old prints, like Vortex and all that kind of stuff. There was a wrapped thing that was, I want to say it was a comic book quarterly. It was like a, a thick book but it was like a quarterly magazine that was put out and bundled with it was a tiny little book called the art of cartoon and or cartooning and philosophy yes. yes i was like oh those look cool bought it and then we packed it went home and then we ended up moving and it was packed away and then one day i was wanting to get back into doing artwork again or cartooning or make comic books or whatever and i was reading this article and they recommended this book and they showed the cover and I was like, wait, I know that book. So this was like two years later. Wow. And I went and I looked and I found it like in the bottom of one of our boxes. And I started going through the lesson plan that he had in there. And the very day he got to the draw a four panel diary of something that happens to you each day was the day that I did my very first cartoon blog. And that was the day that my wife told me that she had cancer. And then... Oh that was when we decided we wanted to do something else with our lives and I was just like I want to get back into art and you know what I'm going to start doing some stuff what can we do and I started this podcast and it was because of that book what? yes that is insane isn't it so the fact that and now I'm talking to you and you're saying you worked with him so let's go back to your story now. Anyway, so there's my backstory. So tell me about this. I, I mean, I'm like speechless right now because that's so random. And yeah. I can honestly say that the only reason that I am an illustrator today and that I draw and am like have connections and am like a confident person, artist, is because of Ivan Brunetti. Wow. He... I showed him my portfolio. I was like dripping sweat. I had never met him, but I read all of his books and I was obsessed with how like crazy and vulgar and bizarre and like poignant he was. And I went to his office and I showed him my illustrations and I was like, I don't have any credits to get into your classes. I don't have anything. Can you please just let me, like, I, I promise you, I care. I, this is my senior year. I just want to be an illustrator. I showed him my work and he let me. He let me take his classes. Yeah. I took his editorial illustration class and then I took his cartooning like comic class and it just like all came together it all came together and he introduced me to like he would always like throw gigs to me you know just gave me advice he was so funny I got to with like a couple of other of his like students that he liked we got to go have like pizza with him after we graduated and like check out his like his house and his wife and his cat and just like just a, a super fantastic person and that I, I felt pretty aimless in my college career that like if, if that hadn't fallen into place I don't, I don't think I would be practicing as an illustrator because I didn't really show anybody else my work there was nothing there like pushing me in that direction like I've, I even had people who instructors like who were like illustration is an art you shouldn't do that you should focus on 
making things look real or making things look blah, blah, blah. Can you draw a person and make it look real? And I was like, no, and I don't want to. Like, that's not who I am. But, you know, you have these professors and people who are artists, working artists, telling you to do something. And you're just kind of like, I don't know. I'm young. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, that's really crazy that we have this connection with Ivan Brunetti randomly. Yours is a real one. Mine is just kind of a made-up one. <laughs> but it's still crazy. Yeah. I hope that it, it makes you feel good that he's a really good dude because, yeah, yeah I, I, have a, I have him to thank for so many things. It's crazy. <laughs> Is this your full-time thing or do you do other things too? I do other things. It's not my full-time thing. Although I spend so much time <laughs> doing it and being connected to other things in Chicago and elsewhere. Most of the stuff that I've gotten is from pitching. I just send emails, submissions to different publications. How do you find them? just online. It's basically like anything that I, illustrators that I like, when I see who they're working for, I try to contact the art director or whatever the formal submission process is. So on websites, a lot of times they'll say, for art submissions or photo submissions, contact this, we have a link to your website, or just kind of like scouring the internet, trying to find the right people to send to. Or if I know somebody who's connected somewhere, like in Chicago, I've done stuff for Pitchfork Review, and it's like I knew that I had, I knew someone through another person, so asking that person, do they ever look for new illustrators? Are they interested in this? And so most of the work that I get is from pitching it or contacting people and saying, hey, what do you think if I set up a booth and I did butt portraits in your space? And then all of a sudden they want a custom portrait of their staff. It kind of just all spirals, but I, I do, I get rejection all the time or I just get nothing, you know, like I send out all these emails or I, I something sounds like it's starting up and then it kind of fizzles out and whatever, but it's being able to manage that, like the letdown and just moving forward. And then now, more so than before, people do contact me, which isn't all the time. It's not like, oh, I just sit back and people are constantly contacting me for these cool jobs. But occasionally it happens and that feels really good because usually when you do the legwork, it's like, it's exhausting and then to have somebody find you or DM you on Instagram and say would you be interested in being a part of the zine or would you want to do that it's just it's kind of nice when there's a, a variety of things going in and coming out well it's a good point because for, as an outsider when you see somebody who is like they're showing up all over the place it looks like oh and oh everybody's just giving them the job yeah. and you don't think about the fact like no that's not really true but also it just means that you're good at promoting yourself when you get it you put it out there and people can see it but you know that also then seeing that like going how come they're getting all the work and then you get the self-loathing and frustration that most people looking at that have totally. but that's a good point you point out it's like no I do it too and you're literally saying you're reaching out in any way you know possible yes yes whether it's like asking a favor of somebody or luckily there's not like phone calls anymore because <laughs> I don't think I can handle that but emails or getting coffee with somebody yeah. like just really trying to network as much as I hate networking and that's not something I'm interested in mm. on like the the person to person level like I don't want to but the schmoozing part right like getting the right people and having possibilities I guess just being open to possibilities like I don't want to put myself in a box that all I do is editorial or all that I do is my own work I just I think that having like a variety of options like teaching or doing like workshops and pop-up portraits it's just nice to have variety and maybe one person won't be interested in me in this way but in another way I could fit into their mold. Did you land the Madison Public Library thing? You were the resident artist there for like a month I think it was? Two months. Yeah, yeah. So when we moved here last um, winter I was kind of like checking things out and I'd always heard really good things about the, the public library system here and the art programming through the bubbler but I didn't really know and I, I immediately assumed like oh I wouldn't get in I wouldn't I wouldn't like make it in the cut but then I thought I'm just gonna apply I'm gonna put in the application and see what happens so I did that in maybe like January or February last year and then I didn't hear a peep until like 
August, I think it was. It's like, move on, it's fine, it's just not meant to be, whatever. And then I get a call from Trent Miller at The Bubbler, and he's just like, we want you to be the first one up in January, February 2018. You're the first illustrator that we're ever going to like, that we've had. We're just excited and open to idea, like super, it sounds cheesy, but like a dream come true in that like they really are awesome to work with. Just everybody's so available and they're like, whatever you want to do, let's do it. And then, and so... I, I wanted to come up with an ambitious plan to do stuff every single week, have workshops sell out and just like make it fun and interesting so people would want to go. Mm-hmm. And so that was really, it was really great. It, it was a lot of work and, and everything, but now I'm about to start another residency at the Monroe Public Library. Right, so, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's gonna be um, it's more spaced out. Like yeah. a, it's gonna be starting next weekend through July. But it's not going to be every weekend. It's more of kind of like the the greatest hits. A couple of new things. I'm, I made a coloring book. I drew out a whole coloring book, and the library is printing it. And I'm going to do a workshop where we're just going to color the coloring book. And it's for kids and adults, so it's really kind of goofy and like random and weird and, okay. and imagination filled. You're also going to be doing a workshop at the other Zine Fest that Wood is putting on. Uh, WD. Yes. Yes, I am. Yeah, I'm. I'm really excited. I'm doing my portrait slam workshop which is basically just playing like two hours of drawing games centered around drawing faces when I do workshops I really like things to move quickly because that's how I draw I because I think the more time you spend on something the more you see what's wrong with it so I do timed exercises and sometimes it's drawing from memory like what right now we're going to draw Jack Nicholson from memory you have one minute and then we kind of work up to doing different things where you do have some visuals or a friend of mine who's a flipbook maker in Chicago he's amazing and he he makes custom flipbooks they're so incredible and it's just like amazing when you look at it you're like how do you do this this is like animation on the most basic fascinating level he used to come to when I used to teach workshops in Chicago he would come to my class and he would do like a little his exercise in the class and his was basically called like crime sketchers whatever he would describe he would have his phone out and he'd be looking at like a celebrity and he would describe it in the most intense detail from like top to bottom but he wouldn't say the person's like sex or race whatever like he kept it so like he, and no he would if anyone was like I know who it is he would he would not give it up and so in and now I use that exercise in my class too because it's so much fun and you see and then you get to see what everybody drew and everyone's drawing the same thing but they're drawing it from what they're hearing and they, everybody has a different way that they draw so stuff like that just kind of taking you out of like the normal like oh we're gonna draw this still life or oh it everything needs to look this way I think the, the classes that I teach try to let people be who they are, but also have fun with it and get out of their head and, and move fast. Rachel doesn't apologize for what she makes and admits that she knows some people won't like it. That really is something that stood out to me. And she does what she does because it makes her happy. It makes her laugh and she enjoys it. Next week, I talk to a place that I've driven by a million times and I just didn't know what it was. So I went in to talk to them to find out. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to the show at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. The music for this podcast is by Lorenzo's Music, which you can learn about at Lorenzo'sMusic.com. Until next time, so long.